Tom here from Lawrence Systems and Tech Supply Direct has sent me a Dell 730 XD that I want to talk about and review here. So this is from Tech Supply Direct on loan from them uh, for some testing and then we, I do have to send it back. But if you want to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hire us button up at the top. If you'd like to support this channel in other ways, there's affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel, including deals from Tech Supply Direct. So we've used them to buy a lot of server equipment that's, you know, not necessarily brand new, slightly used. They have things newer than this 730. Uh, I've been asked before why I like to review some of the older hardware, and I'm like, well, this is easier for someone to get started in their home lab, and sometimes very adequate and plenty of power for many companies, and there's still plenty of life left in a 730. Now, they do have some, like I said, the mo more modern ones there. We have an offer code uh, that gets you 10% off your purchase at Tech Supply Direct. And you know, it was someone we've been using for a while, and we reached out to them, and you know, we find a lot of stuff. We talked to them, and uh, we we're going to work out some deals where they send us some hardware for some more demos to kind of show you what the options are. Uh, frequently, we've worked with people who have purchased from Tech Supply Direct, but then after they purchase, we just remotely uh, go in and configure things because we not everything that goes uh, purchase-wise comes through here for me to review. So they sent this in for review and I wanted something that would run FreeNAS really well. And as you've seen from the beginning here, we got 24 drives up in the front and we got a couple more drives. I'm gonna flip it around the back now, hiding in the back here. So we got these two in the back, which are SSDs. And ideally you could use them for loading your OS on. Uh, I decided instead, and we'll jump to the overhead here in a second, and go over the parts on this, I decided instead to load the OS on a thumb drive. That way all the drives are available and I could do some tests. And we'll do a couple benchmarks on this and a little bit of testing. Because, you know, of course, what is a system if you don't at least see if it actually performs? So I'm not going to spend too much time on synthetic benchmarks. We'll hook up some, uh, use this as a storage array for my XCPNG and show the performance that we can get over a 10 gig interface on here. So let's take a look from the overhead and dive into it. For several generations, the Dell servers, the Dell Rack servers, have a pretty similar layout to each other. So we're gonna remove the air plenum right here, and you can reveal we've got 64 gigs of RAM in it. We'll get to the actual detailed specs when we log into the iDRAC system. We do have the, flan the fans, which are removable, and nice fan system on here. They're not dual fans, they are single uh, each one, but hot swappable. So pretty easy there. If you wanted to take the entire fan array out, that's what these two blue levers would do and the whole array would pop out. But if you needed to really get in here, clean it good, um, that is something you can do. Generally speaking in the Dells, orange has meant something you can hot swap. Uh, so you can actually just pop the lid on this while it's running, drop these fans in and out. Blue, uh, don't take the blue apart while it's on and running. That would not be a good idea. Now. Hidden over here, we do have a couple SATA connectors. I didn't have one handy, uh, but these are probably would support probably a SATA DOM if you wanted to hook it up that way. I put this little USB thumb drive in there and that's reloaded operating system too. Now the back plane over here with the two drives that are hidden back here, and we pop one out real quick. It is going through the back. Ideally, these are good SSDs for loading up your OS on, and you can set this up to a mirror over in the back. And you know, your mirror, your OS drives are usually not having as much read and write going on uh, for the boot. Let's say you're running this as either a VMware server, in this case we're going to be using FreeNAS or XCPNG. You could have a couple SSDs mirrored back here, and that's solid. I wanted all the drives available, so I was using this. Now this is facilitated and hooked up. This back plane and the front is all hooked over to this PERC controller. And this particular model is the Dell HBA Mini 330. Now, the importance of that, it is passing this through. Something very important for FreeNAS is that it has direct access to drives. If you virtualize them or you know some trickery where you take a, a different controller but set each drive to its own individual and pass through each drive but it passes through a RAID controller, FreeNAS uh, doesn't have direct access. That's not the ideal situation. With this, there's no RAID configuration at all going on here. It's passing all 26 total drives on here right through to FreeNAS and 27 if you count the USB drive right here. Now here, as you can see, when the airflow goes down, it also catches on this little part right here. And it's kind of hard to see unless you took this out, but this is the SFP Plus, two 10 gig SFP Plus Intel with two one gig connections. So we have dual 10 gig SFP Plus connections and two one gig connections on here. Now let's also spin around and talk about the back of it real quick. On the back of this unit, 
We do have dual power supplies. You can see the SFP pluses, but all the way over on the side here, uh, this one right there is the iDRAC and it's the professional version of iDRAC. We'll talk about that when we go in there. Uh, having as its own separated, dedicated uh, network interface is really handy because now it doesn't have to share with any of these. It's separate. You can have your own completely separate management network and that's for essentially like what they call lights out management. So from there, we can actually turn this machine on and off, boot it up, etc., and control it and complete remote KVM console all from a web interface, which is nice because that's where we're going to go next. Now, as far as loading FreeNAS in here, uh, that was pretty straightforward to do. We used the virtual media. I'll talk about when we get to that part, how that works. It's not, wasn't that difficult to load FreeNAS. Um, you need to set the boot order to be this particular drive, but it does support booting off of these drives because they're all passed through individually. So however you want to set it up. It does support when you're booting with these drives, something worth mentioning if you're doing this. If you're using these drives, because there's so many of them presented, use, installing FreeNAS EFI, UEFI is the ideal way to do it, I found out, um, and to make it work properly without some weird drive configurations where it doesn't know which drive to pick because there's 26 of them and it sees it through the controller and tries to uh, run through them. That was a little bit of a challenge. Just install it UEFI. When you're installing it as a USB right here, uh, I chose standard BIOS install and then I went into BIOS and just said boot off that drive and it worked perfectly fine. Last little thing I'll comment on is if you were going to do something along the lines of, I pop this out, putting a couple extra cards in here, maybe you have some more tanky cards you want to put in or any other type of expansions. Um, it does have that ability here, but make sure if you get one of these servers, there are some connectors, and we'll go back to the overhead real quick. Uh, connectors right here, hard to see on the edge, but you get the idea there's a little connector that would go to power the card if you have a card that needs uh, power, but we'll go ahead and just snap that back in. I don't have any extra cards. Ordering this with the built-in, uh, well, integrated Intel one right down here, it, it's just handy to do that. That way I don't even have to do any add-in cards. Now this is also, and I did a review of the R630 that we have, and I, the 630 doesn't have as many uh, expansion slots, but if you're not going to use them, you can save a few dollars sometimes to get the 630. Um, you lose a little expansion slots, but if you just need the 10 gig ports on the back, you're good to go. All right, so let's put this back together. We're gonna to slide it in a rack and do the fun part where we'll dive into the iDRAC, show um, the iDRAC overview, show free Nash running, and of course benchmark it because we wanna see how we lay out 26 drives and uh, what's some efficient ways to do that. Before we dive into the iDRAC, I wanted to mention, because this always comes up, well, how much was this server and where do I get it? Uh, we like I said, this came from Tech Supply Direct, and it is the Dell PowerEdge 730XD. So you can spec one out for yourself right here. The base price starts here and then goes up from, you know, depending on what kind of drives and whatnot that you want to add it. I dropped the settings in the cart from the specs on this particular server, and we came up with about $45.99. But don't forget, we have a coupon code for LTS services. So if you paste that in and hit apply goes down a little bit. So you save about $450 with our offer code. And this applies to whatever you want to buy from them. Um, and there's a lot of options. You can buy the drives from them. Maybe you have the drives already. Maybe you only need some of the parts. You need the base of the system, but you have some other parts you're going to put together. There's a lot of different things you can think about and do this, but I wanted to at least show it out there because this question always comes up in the comments. Well, how much was it or how much is it exactly like you have? And if we filled it out like this. And the only thing I didn't include in here was the two rear drives that, uh, that are in here. I didn't see them in this particular list. Um, but like I said, you're, you're looking at about $4,100 for this server. Now let's get into the fun part of what can it do. One of the things I really recommend, and I did that in that build over there, I really recommend getting the iDRAC Enterprise version because this gives you all the bells and whistles when it turns to uh, things like this. And we're actually gonna launch this and see it all set up. So we'll hit launch. And away we go. We have complete remote control of it. I would do this in my other part of the studio, but with the system running, it does produce a little bit of noise. So let's actually talk about how noisy is this thing. When you first start it up, it's around, oh, I don't know, 72, 73 decibels here as I have in my system. Once it idles down and it's under lower load, it goes down to eh, about 69 or so. So it's not incredibly loud, but it's still a bunch of ambient noise I don't necessarily want in the background while I'm recording. So it's in the other room and I'm back here in my office recording. So it's not too unreasonably loud. Now, the nice thing is the iDirect has the ability to not only tell you everything on the screen here, but also the ability to 
notify you. So there's a series of notices you can set in here uh, for different thresholds, for uh, alerts if you have a problem with one of the fans going out or one of the power supplies fails, et cetera, et cetera. So all that information in, can be programmed within here, SNMP and alert settings. Uh, and also, by the way, because it supports SNMP, you can also have this monitored by other tools and Xavix might be an example, one I've talked about before. And there are ways you can have Xavix pull the information out of here via the IPMI and SNMP alerts. So let's go down here, iDirect settings, hardware. Let's dive into the exactly what hardware is in this. Uh, system CMOS battery, good. Fans, checks all the fans on here, tells you uh, currently what they're running at, which we're not putting much load on here. So it looks like we're running about 43% fan. Processor wise, we have Intel Xeon E5 2670V3, 2.3 gigahertz. We got a pair of those in here. Memory, we've got DDR4, eight gig sticks totaling in 64 gigs. Uh, this is ECC because this is what people really want. If you're building an enterprise type server, yes, ECC is quite ideal. Front panel, uh, not much on there for the front panel information because it's if you notice this is missing the usual display panel. Once you stick all those drives in there for this particular configuration, you don't get the cool little LED readout, but I never really look at them as much as I look at this or the alerts that may come out of here. Network devices, here's our integrated Intel NIC. I will expand that out and away we go. We can see the link status, uh, one up and the rest are down. I just have the one 10 gig port plugged in. This also does support SRR, SRIOV. So that is an option on this particular network card, which is a way to virtualize and pass through the network card to a virtualization system underneath. We also have um, current wattage that's being used, input wattage, output wattage, uh, firmware version. These are a pair of uh, the power supplies that are in there they are platinum rated in efficiency the uh, 750 watt ones they do have a higher wattage one if you need it if you have you know different use cases and i haven't really messed much with this uh, maybe that'll be a future video but so far it seemed a little confusing there's uh both usb management and then of course the dell v flash now, when we tried installing it using the vFlash, uh, apparently I don't know what I'm doing. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, that didn't work as well. I, I thought I understood it in concept, and you're supposed to be able to put a little SD card in there with the OS on there and uh, run it or potentially install it. Uh, that doesn't seem to work as well as I thought. So we'll get to how we installed it. And there's an easy way to do it. It just, I thought this would be easier than it was. Uh, if someone has a good article or write up on vFlash and they want to leave it in the comments below or on the forum post, I'll, I'll take the time to read it, maybe play with it later. Uh, I just thought it might be easy to do, but I was wrong. Um, physical disks, well, it's not easy for me. So someone can point out that you just don't know what you're doing, Tom, and I'm fine with that answer. Um, physical disks. So here's all the drives. And as I said, there is no RAID configuration. All of these are being 100% passed through to the underlying operating system. Now this has... And you can see these drives right here. These are 12 gig a second. That's the max supported on a backplane. SAS, 12 gig a second on here. Uh, they're Dell branded, but they're technically uh, Seagate hard drives near 10,000 RPM. So that's all these spinning disk drives. And then we have the SSDs that we didn't install the OS on, but we could have installed the OS on. Actually, they're solid state one all the way down here. But they're only connected. The ones that they uh, text supply direct shipped were only connected at 6 gigs. So plenty fast enough for SSDs. Ideal for uh, OS installs, uh, especially you set them up in a mirror and you're pretty solid on them for that, for reliability. Um, and FreeNAS specifically, running FreeNAS even on a thumb drive isn't that big of a deal. Uh, obviously, mirrored thumb drives would be better. But uh, FreeNAS on the thumb drive, the OS itself is not write intensive, but other virtualization ones because of logging they do and everything else may be more write intensive. So if you're installing this, and we may reconfigure this with a uh, setup for XCPNG, then it's more ideal to install XCPNG onto those drives in the back because, well, all the logging and everything is more write intensive. Uh, FreeNAS does have the ability to do logging onto the data set as well. We'll show that setup when we get this thing configured. Now, when you launch the console here, this is really nice because one, I can be in here doing this. The other thing is the virtual media. So can we go connect virtual media? And it takes a second. We can choose and map the CD DVD file here. This is how we loaded FreeNAS. Like I said, I was hoping it'd be easier through the iDirect, but this is actually a pretty simple way to do it. You go here, you find the ISO file of what you're looking for, and whichever ISO you choose to load, you can 
uh, copy it here, and it loads reasonably fast. It is using the network connection speed from your computer uh, to connect it. So if you are remotely doing this, it's going to be a lot slower, but it, I'm doing it local here, and it installed quite reasonably fast to get this done. So installing was no problem over this particular uh, setup using the virtual media. We'll go ahead and close that. You can also boot it off a USB and some of the other things. Uh, there are other options for uh, setting it up. But now that we've got free NAS configured, let's log into it. And we see it's at 192.168.3.212. And what we have is no configuration set up on this yet. Okay, so from here, we've got it set up and ready to add a pool. There's no pool. That's why the pool menu is particularly missing from this. Uh, we do see our 10 gig connection here. And I will comment uh, that if someone wants to know a system data set right here, it doesn't have a, it's on the boot pool for syslog. This is where you would change that to the other one on there. So uh, that's questions come up a couple times. Let's go over to pools though and create a pool. So add a pool, create pool. These are some Seagate drives or ocean doors as we started calling them. We'll call it ocean door SAS. Check that encryption box. I always like to encrypt all the drives. If you get used to encrypting everything by default, life's just a little bit easier. Now, if you want, you could make this one giant pool. That is a big discussion. Let's break that out real quick before we do this. Now, I've referenced this before. This is a great write-up right from the folks at IX Systems of how the data blocks are written and how to make wide or narrow different VDEVs, whether you want to split them up, whether or not you want them to be all one giant pool. Um, there are a lot of options and these are all the considerations. So are you optimizing for read IOPS, write IOPS, streaming speed, streaming write, streaming read, storage efficiency? As in when you go to, it's not like just the triangle of efficiency like I've talked about before. If you really dive deep into it, uh, it is more. It is trying to balance five factors all together of each of these. One, two, three, four, five different options and balancing them out. So we won't get too much into it, but we will say that after a little bit of testing, I think what's a good balance for speed for this particular setup is we have the 24 drives. Is We're going to take the 24 drives, not like I said, leave a link to this so you can make your own informed decision. Uh, with the 24 drives, splitting them up into three sets of eight seems pretty efficient. Uh, it gives us a really good write speed. If you give it a 24 drives uh, and you get a good read speed with all 24 drives, but you get a better read speed with me and break them up to the VDEVs into three sets of eight. So like I said, there's a couple different scenarios. I'm not going to dive into that in depth and I'll leave you some reading and I've done a another video talking about performance. Now, this is another cool feature that they've added in FreeNAS to make this easier. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, whoops. And then we set this to RAID Z2 down here and we hit repeat, repeat two more times. Yeah, because that's the drives that match. Now we have these drives here. Now we can make different decisions of what we want to do with the drives. This is where the synchronization comes in when you're dealing with ZFS and Zill. So if you were to go down here, and we wanted to add a log drive. The problem being, these drives being that they're SATA, or I'm sorry, SAS 6, not SAS 12 gig, and they're only SSDs, not MVMEs, uh, you really have to figure out whether or not they're worth it to put the log drive in. What that means is it will take the ZIL and be able to write it out there. You do get, when you have synchronous writes forced on, you're gonna get better performance with it than without it. But generally, when you're doing an NFS share, it's better to have it not having synchronous writes and it uses the memory to commit the uh, ZIL and then write it there. That does cause a risk, and I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but it does cause a risk of potentially losing up to five seconds worth of data if there was a sudden catastrophic failure of the machine, like a sudden power loss to completely everything. Ideally, if you're going to do these, there's a whole article and a good write-up here on Serve the Home about different you know drives you should use and why the older drives and with these new 12 uh, backplane dr SAS drives that we have in here, even though they're spinning, you're just not going to get much performance unless you go with something like these, like uh, higher end options. They talk about Optane. They talk about MVMEs. You're going to need something a lot faster to really pick up performance if you want to force uh, full synchronization on there. We're just going to go, in particular for this demo, we're going to have the synchronization turned off when we set up our NFS. But um, go ahead. If you want to read, I'll leave a link to this over on Server the Home where they break that down. All right. Now we can use these as caching drives. Uh, they're probably pretty good as cache, but we'll add them later. For now, we're going to build it without the cache and start running the benchmarks and we'll show adding the cache later. 
So we have this all set and ready to go. We did Z2, we have uh, three sets, and let's go ahead and hit Create. Create pool. If you wanna see what's going on in the background, this is what it looks like. It's uh, creating the encryption, building all the drives, and this is what actually gets dumped to the screen. We'll just slide that back over and speed up through this. And Freenas says download encryption key. Don't lose that. I've commented on this a couple times. I love that they make you download it uh, to go further. Uh, that's really important that you have it. Healthy, two point, uh, 4.6 terabytes free. Now I'll reference this real quick when you're building these out. So when you do the ZFS build out on here, and we'll actually change this to RAID Z2 so it matches, uh, we have drive capacity of 300, we have eight drives, and number of RAID groups is three, calculate. So we come up with a similar number. If we would have made these and we just said uh, 24 and one, 24 and one, just so you know, we would have had more usable storage, but we would have lost a little bit on our read speeds because the way each VDEV is set up, all the data is striped across all these VDEVs. So this gives us better read speeds, but the writes still have to commit to all the drives. So each of the parity writes in the, um, that have to go on there are spread out across the drives, but they still have to commit to those drives. But when we read the data back, we will get better read performance. But like I said, this comes down to some of the sacrifices you make, whether you wanted to make it one large drive uh, where you have the best capacity versus uh, splitting them up a little bit. But Z2 means we can also lose because it's Z2 double parity out of each of these. And we'll go over here and look at them real quick. We can lose a couple drives out of each of these. So we have a pretty good fault tolerance on there. And there's, uh, if we have to rebuild the data, it's only gonna tax these particular drives to really rebuild the data on this particular set because each one of these is its own RAID Z2 VDEV that makes up this entire pool. And like I said, I'm not gonna dive too deep into every scenario for testing. I just don't have the time to do it, but we'll say that this is pretty adequate and we'll jump on those tests. Now, one of the things we can do here is go over to the jails and we'll do our first test. Choose a cage for jail. Choose. All right. And we go back over to our pools. And there's IO cage. Now, I just did a demo on this the other day, and this is what it was for. It's to show you how easy this is to do. I happen to already have on here the root at 192.168.3.212. Oh, uh, there we go. And I have the pharonix.zip file here. Now we have to copy that over. So cp pharonix.zip to mount chindor io cage images. We just copy that file over there. It happened to be, this is actually on the thumb drive. Uh, so the thumb drive is the root of it and then mount ocean doors where all those data sets are that we just built. Then we go io cage import and it's the pharonix file here. Importing. Done. And that's in real time. It imports really fast. Uh, this drive, there's plenty of power with this machine. All right, we'll slide this out of the way. We'll go over to the jail. We'll go over here to uh, jails. And we'll go ahead and kick off this as a start job. Okay, Pharonix is up and running. So let's go ahead and SSH into that and run a benchmark. Because that's what wants to know is how fast is it? P2. So Pharonix test suite benchmark PTS slash IO zone. We'll choose a 64 kilobit, we'll two gig writes, and we're gonna do test all options, just read and write on that. We would like to save the results, yes. Let's give the file a name, and we're gonna give it the name of LTS Dell R730XD. There we go, 24 drives, three by eight Z2 VDEV. Overthought that. All right, press enter, and we'll kick off this and let it run. While it's running real quick, let's go ahead and go here. There's V1, and we'll watch all the write spread across the RAID Z2 drives. Oh, reads and writes, and we'll see what kind of performance levels we get out of this.
All right, we like to save the testing results. Yes, yes, yes. Go include everything. Copy link. And let's see what kind of performance we got out of this. Not bad. So uh, 24 drives, we're writing 906, pretty, pretty reasonable there. Um, here's our reads. So you can see we're way up here on the read. So uh, this is with no, none of those cache drives added. Now I do have, and let me pull this up over here. This was a previous benchmark I did. And this particular benchmark shows what the, right. I did have the log in there, but it doesn't matter for reads. Log is only for writing. Um, you can see the substantial difference uh, this made. So 1614 with 24 drives, all one giant Z pool. And in here, 24 drives, three by eight Zev D2. So 64K, two gig, 64K, two gig. Exactly the same test on exactly the same hardware. Nothing changed here other than the way we laid out the pool. So you can, I'll leave links to both of these so you can pick through them and examine it. Now, one thing to note, if you force syncing on, you went from this 913, right? And this is with the log drive uh, versus we're about the same. There's some levels of deviation you may get, but with 24 drive VDEV, we're still at 906 right, and that's still without a log, but this is not without syncing turned on. So this is one of the reasons I had that. If once you start turning on the syncing, um, it it's a challenge. Like I said, I'm not gonna dive too deep into the why or why not syncing. You can leave it off and it's safe, um, but read up on it. So now let's test VM performance on here. So we kind of get the idea of what it can do um, read and write wise on here with the current setup, which is this one here, 24 drives, three by eight Z devs. We will go ahead and add those drives as cache drives though, because there's some performance gain to be added by that. We can, we'll run one more test that actually will just run the same test again after I add the cache drives. But for the Pharonix test, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. It, probably makes more of a difference depending on use case and specifically cache is going to be helpful. Uh, a good use case would be even like my video editing set up on this with video editing. Well, you're going to repeatedly pull the same assets and therefore if they get stuck on those particular drives, it's going to be great. But the other thing is this system has 64 gigs of RAM. That extra RAM is going to help tremendously with the speed of frequently accessed files on there, especially over like an SMB share. So let's go ahead and extend the pool real quick. We'll go ahead and add these two drives as cache. Extend, confirm, download encryption key. This is something of note when you change the drives around, the encryption keys get updated. It has you download them again. So now we have, we'll go back over here to status, the two cache drives down here. So plenty of cache now, plenty of memory, and we'll run that same test one more time and we're only we're just going to do the same test but we'll only really need to check it for read performance to see if that made any difference because these are read cache not write cache option two option two and option two for read yes and you do have to give the results file the same name so let's go ahead and do that real quick that way it should append to this one and cache drives all right, and let this kick off. This should run fairly quick. And we can see some of the cache hits here. We'll see if that gives us much of a boost in terms of performance though, because uh, it's not, the goal of this when it's doing the reading is to exhaust some of the caches uh, when the Pharonix running, but it doesn't know that ZFS is going to, you know, fight against it for those cache hits. So hopefully we get uh, based on the file system we're using. It probably would vary a lot more on the Phronix test uh, now that we have the cache if we use different uh, sizes in the test options. So using a file size of two gig versus uh, one of the larger file sizes may make a little bit more difference. And of course, when you start talking about VMs or even video asset files on there, um, if they get hit on the cache, uh, they're generally a lot larger when you have a large video file that you're editing. So the cache will benefit. It may not be a dramatic difference in this particular test though. Okay, yes, upload the results. Yes, yes. Copy link. And maybe a small boost in performance, but it's within the deviation here. So even with the cache drives, like I said, I didn't expect it to do a massive performance boost, but you know, there, maybe there's a little bit. So we get 31 here, but we're still within the deviation. Uh, that is something that 
the system caching it, and this is where the Pharonix system is going. I think there's some wild numbers going here. This is what this means, so that's the deviation it had on drive. Still an impressive performance on in terms of read performance on these drives, and I didn't test the right because it's not going to change much. All right, now let's actually throw something on here and uh, see how it performs in terms of uh, read write performance using it for I.O. for a virtual machine. So I have this NFS share built and ready on XCPNG. It's already mounted to it, already copied some things there. I will show the options. And yes, sync is disabled as you should on an NFS share to get any real performance out of it. And I have a few things running. And I already got them running in the background here. So I've got the Pharonix just beating up on the system right now. You can see all the read and writes going across here. We can see that the cache drives are being used as well. And what I wanted to show was not just a specific performance, although I did run this, and this is, I'll leave a link to this one as well. Here's what it looked like running inside the jail on in IO cage directly on the server. This is a Debian VM running on XCPNG, but using this free NAS R73 as a storage server. And you get these because of the caching, some really crazy numbers in terms of read performance, but the write performance is writing out at about uh, 450 here, so not bad. And what we have here is me running several VMs and doing several Pharonix tests and a Windows test in here. So I wanted to see how many IOPS you could get out of this. So peak data IO throughput was quite good here. So, you know, uh, 858, uh, 778. So good numbers there. But our IOPS were, you know, here we peaked out at about 24,000 IOPS. And that's on the uh, writing and on the read IOPS, we're able to pull 19,000. And this is just back and forth Windows uh, running. What do I have? Windows running over here to Windows lab tests. And these are going to be skewed because everything's writing back and forth at the same time. I did this on purpose because you get really crazy numbers inside of VMs when you try to benchmark them. They provide some data, but they're hard to get really solid data out of. But by running these uh, benchmarks, and of course, you're never running a single VM on a single storage. Well, maybe you are, but generally you built the VM to have lots of them running. So by setting up a couple VMs running, we're able, Windows is surprisingly able to write really fast on uh, to this particular drive. And then Pharonix uh, running in the background over here. Oh. Test exit with non-zero stats. Sometimes there's too much deviation. Uh, it fails not because it failed to write. It just because the deviation seems too much with all the different loads going. But you get the idea by looking at the back end here. When we go back over here to storages, look at the lab and the stats. That's why I jumped over to here for that. So you can see that we definitely get really good performance with only a single 10 gig. So this setup is, there is a, this is running on my uh, Dell servers in the back. It goes through two switches which shouldn't really cause any problem, but they do talk at 10 gig. This is not more than 10 gig though. It's only 10 gig. So that's why I ran some of the first benchmarks running inside of a jail inside of the FreeNAS directly, as opposed to using as an attached storage. But likely when you're using FreeNAS, you're going to do it as an attached storage. But you can see there's you know plenty of performance to get out of this machine. So uh, benchmarks based on this configuration, that's what I wanted to share and you know kind of show its use case. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general. Even suggestions for new videos, they're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.